Hello, Professor. Can we start? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the another session of the Network Seminar Series hosted by the Center for Network Intelligence at the ECE and RBCCPS IIC. Today's talk is by Dr. Raghuvan Saxena, and he will be speaking on tight bounds for general computation in noisy broadcast networks. Dr. Raghuvan is a reader at the School of Technology and Computer Science at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. His primary research interest is communication complexity and its applications to another areas of theoretical computer science, such as coding theory, algorithm gaming theory, streaming algorithms, and distributed systems. Other topics of interest are computational complexity and information theory. Before, doing, before joining TAFR, he received his PhD from Princeton University under the amazing supervision of Professor Gillard Cole and his bachelor's degree in computer science and engineering from IIT Delhi. Before we move on to the talk, we would like to request the audience to subscribe for, to our Google group for a, more information on our future talks. You can also visit our website for more details. I will be pasting the links in the chat box. Please do check. Finally, we request the audience to keep your microphones on silent for the duration of the talk, except when asking questions. And for questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly or type them in the chat box and we will relay your questions. Over to you, Dr. Ravinch. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be speaking to all of you. The title for today's, today's talk is Tide Bounds for General Computation in Noisy Broadcast Network. And I gave this, I put this title on the slide because that's the title of the paper. But the real title that you need to remember is down here. It says Interactive Coding for Wireless Systems. I will show you the model of noisy broadcast networks. It will be a very basic, a very simplified model of a general wireless system. And the problem we will consider for this model is the problem of interactive coding. So let's start. Of course, I do not have to introduce wireless systems. Um, we all know what they are. The only reason we have satellites and we have cell phones is because of wireless systems. The only reason I'm able to give this talk from Mumbai is because we have a wireless system. And essentially, um, the broadcast channel is a very simple, a very basic abstraction for wireless system. Now, the problem we want to study on this broadcast system is the problem of interactive coding. And the problem is motivated uh, because when we design protocols for a broadcast channel, or in fact, any channel, we would like to assume that if we send a message from one device to another device, then that message is received directly. And this assumption is something that we would like to have, but it's not true in the real world. Many systems, there are errors, the messages may get delayed, they may get dropped, they may be changed by the time they reach the other party. So there are these noise uh, patterns, different noise models that you can imagine for your message. And therefore, there is a gap between what we ideally want, which is to design protocols assuming perfect reception of every message and what we have in the real world where there is noise. And interactive coding is generally the problem of bridging this gap. In interactive coding, the goal is to design a compiler that will take a protocol that is designed for a noiseless system, which is the ideal world, which is where we want to design our protocols and convert it to a, another protocol efficiently, uh, there's a notion of efficiency that we will define later, but to convert it efficiently to another protocol that works in the real world, which is when there is noise in the channel. Uh, there is something in the chat. Oh. Existing uh, Google group link, Professor. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so we want to go from the real world, we want to uh, compile a protocol that is designed assuming there is no noise, which is where we want to design a protocols, to a real world protocol where there is noise. And this is the problem of interactive coding. We will study this on the simple broadcast channel, which I will define next. Um, so the way to understand a broadcast channel is the most simple way I know is to just think of many people in a room. And here there are six people. There are edges between any two uh, pairs uh, because they are in the same room and therefore a message from anyone will be heard by every other person. And this is called a broadcast channel because the people are not speaking in each other's ears. They are just speaking out loud. So when say this guy, he says something, he sends a message, then the same message is received at all the other, uh, by all the other people. Now, if this is noiseless, then of course, whatever this guy says will be received at all the other, by all the other people. 
but we do not have a noiseless system. We have a noisy system, which means that whenever this child tries to say something, let's say he's sending a bit zero or one, then with probability epsilon independently, the bit may get flipped. So suppose this guy here is sending a zero, then everybody will receive a zero with probability one minus epsilon, which is the correct message. And with the remaining probability of epsilon, the bit will get flipped. So the message received um, by the other parties will be one. And the way the protocol will go is that you will have a se sequence of rounds in every round, someone will be talking, he will send a message with epsilon probability, everybody will get a corrupted message independently, and then you'll go to the next round and so on and so on. Okay. So now the goal is very simple. You are given a protocol that is designed assuming epsilon equal to zero, which is when there is no noise. And you want to compile it or you want to simulate it. I will use these words interchangeably to a protocol that works when epsilon is a constant larger than zero. Let's say epsilon is 0.1 for, for the purpose of this talk. And if uh, you were not confused already at this point. I will not confuse you by introducing two different variations in the model. So the variations will be an adaptive protocol versus a non-adaptive protocol. And, and whether a protocol is adaptive or non-adaptive, it depends on whether or not the order in which the parties are speaking is determined in advance or not. Remember, I said that there is a sequence of rounds and in each round, people may speak and whatever they speak, Will be received at the uh, at the by the rest of the people directly with probability one minus epsilon and corrupted with probability epsilon. Now a protocol is said to be non-adaptive if even before the protocol starts, you know exactly when the people are talking. You do not know what they are going to say, but you know who is going to say. So you may know something like. This guy here will speak in the first round, then this guy will go and he will speak in the second round, then this guy will speak in the third round and so on. This is fixed. This will not change during the execution of the protocol. If this is true, then the protocol is non-adaptive. The adaptive model is a generalization of the non-adaptive model where you no longer have this restriction that the parties are, the order in which the parties speak is determined in advance. In the adaptive model, both whether or not the parties are speaking and what they are speaking, if they are speaking, is determined during the protocol. It's determined in an online way based on the messages they have received so far. Okay. Are there any questions about this definition? Okay. Uh, so, in practical scenarios, these epsilons could vary, right? I mean, uh, these epsilons could be different for different receivers. Yes, it, it could be different for different receivers. So we'll not really use the fact that they are the same, but we will use the fact that the noise is independent. The, the sameness will not be crucial as long as there are all some constants, and but the independence will be crucial. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the first thing I would like to state is that adaptive protocols are more powerful than non-adaptive protocols because they give the parties more freedom. The parties can decide when they want to speak, but they don't have to use this freedom. They can just say that, okay, I could have spoken whenever, but I will only speak in the second round. And everybody can decide on an order of speaking and then the protocol will become non-adaptive. So adaptive protocols are at least as powerful as non-adaptive protocols. And in fact, they are much more powerful because suppose everybody has a bit and you want to compute the OR of all the bits, then if you are non-adaptive, you need at least n rounds because um, maybe the first n minus one people who are talking are all zeros and the last one can either be a zero or one and you wouldn't know that till you get to the end round. So for computing the OR, a non-adaptive protocol needs at least n rounds, but with adaptivity, you can do much better. You can have a protocol where the parties will only speak if they have a one. And then the previous situation I described where n minus one people are zero and one of them at most one of them has a one, then this guy who has a one will be the one speaking in the first round and he will know the answer in one round itself. So adaptive protocols are much, much more powerful than non-adaptive protocols. And this is something to keep in mind. But for now, because we have two different models, non-adaptive versus adaptive, and we have a noiseless model and a noisy model, this gives four interactive coding questions based on whether the noiseless protocol is non-adaptive or adaptive, 
and whether you're simulating it using a non-adaptive or an adaptive protocol. So this is what this rectangle stands for. And because adaptive protocols are much more powerful than non-adaptive protocols, I claim that this square here, it's not interesting. The reason is that even if you did not have noise, then going from adaptive to non-adaptive requires a huge overhead. There are functions that are very simple with adaptive, but are hard with non-adaptive. And therefore with noise, it can only be worse. And it's not interesting to consider this, but the other three are interesting. And let's see what we know about each of them. The first thing I'd like to say is because the noise that we consider is random, I claim that um, an overhead of log n rounds is sufficient. What do I mean by that? Suppose you have n parties in the system. We had six in the picture, so n was six. And we will assume throughout that the total number of rounds in the protocol is polynomial in n. So log n is also log the length of the protocol up to ground strength. Now, suppose you have such a system and suppose you simulate it using the following uh, protocol. You take the following um, scheme. You take the original protocol and for each round in the original protocol, you repeat it log n times. Then you have log n copies of the bit. You take the majority and then you use the majority as a correct bit. Now, because the noise is independent in every round, the probability that a majority of log n is incorrect is very small. It is one over poly n. And this allows you to union bound over all the n people in your system and all the rounds in your protocol to get that the entire simulation will work correctly, except with probability one over poly n. So the worst, it is very easy to get an overhead of log n for any of these three squares. And the whole game is, can we get this overhead down to a constant? Suppose I have a protocol of length t in the noiseless uh, model. Can I get a protocol of length O of t in the noisy model? Because t log n is very easy. I just repeat log n times and I'll get it. And this is the game we don't play. We, we want to know what is the right answer between one and log n for the overhead. Now, for the first square, let me tell you what is known. For the first square, when noiseless protocols are being compiled to noiseless, oh, sorry, non-adaptive protocols are being compiled to non-adaptive simulations, then the best upper bound that we know is O of log n. It's the easy upper bound that I just described. And we also have a lower bound, which is which says that the overhead must be at least log log n. So you cannot hope to get a constant overhead. And therefore, the game here is what is the right answer between log log n and log n. Now, this is assuming that the simulation is non-adaptive. What happens if the simulation is adaptive? Adaptive simulations, like I said, are very powerful. And we showed a few years ago that, in fact, if you start with a noise, noiseless non-adaptive protocol, then you can make it resilient to noise using an adaptive protocol with only a constant overhead. This is the dream scenario, remember. If you have a protocol of length t, then this means that there's an adaptive way to simulate that protocol over a noisy channel using only O of t rounds, using only a constant uh, factor more number of rounds. So ad adaptivity actually gives you much more power. You can prove that there is a separation between non-adaptive and adaptive, even in this case. This is the second square. Now let's go to the third square. What if you start with adaptive noiseless protocols? And even here, we have a result that says that for a certain noise model, you can get adaptive protocols simulated using a different adaptive protocol, so only a constant overhead. There is more to say about this. We have an upcoming work that is working on a slightly more general setting. So this box will be updated maybe, maybe if I'm invited again. But um, for now, let us say that whenever you have an adaptive simulation, then you can simulate even adaptive protocols with a constant overhead. And the only open problem that remains is what is the right answer for non-adaptive to non-adaptive? I want to emphasize one point here that this is actually the original question. When the model of broadcast was proposed, this was back in the 80s, I think, 87 or 88 by El Jamal. Then the protocols that were considered were all non-adaptive. And this was the main question that was proposed. What is the overhead to simulate non-adaptive protocols using other non-adaptive protocols. And we know that for many easy functions, we even know the right answer. So some function like, uh, let's say, if, if everybody has a bid and you want to know the parity of all the bits, or let's say if you have a threshold function on all of these bits, then we know tight results for 
all of these um, simple functions. And none of them are able to show the separation between Lord Lorden and Lorden. This is what we achieve in this work. We show that for non-adaptive protocols, if you want to simulate them using other non-adaptive protocols, then an overhead of root log in is both necessary and sufficient. There are protocols that need at least root log in rounds. And for any protocol, root log in rounds are sufficient. And this is the main result that I'll be talking about. Um, formally, it says that the interactive coding overhead, which is a fancy way of saying the multiplicative factor, more number of rounds needed to simulate any noiseless protocol by a noisy protocol. For non-adaptive broadcast, non-adaptive is both for the noiseless protocol being simulated and the simulation and broadcast is the broadcast channel, is theta of, uh, there's a tilde here that we will ignore, is theta of root log n. And it's a, it's a matching upper and lower bound. So any questions about the, the result? Okay, cool. So this is the main result. Um, there are some points, some remarks that I would like to make about this before actually going on to a sketch of the proof. And the first remark is that typically, okay, this, this paper is now there, so I can't say this for all papers, but typically what is usually seen in, in interactive coding is for models of communication, you basically have two answers. One of them is that there is, an, there is a constant overhead interactive coding scheme, which means that this number here, which is theta log n is actually of one. This is the best you can hope for. Or you have very good lower bounds or essentially very bad lower bounds based on how you look at it, which says that for some models, um, there are protocols that are very hard to simulate in the presence of noise. And you need the trivial way of simulating by repeating order times is, is essentially optimal. And this, when it was published, it was the first model that, that I know of uh, that is somewhere in the middle, which is you. the right answer is either the best possible constant or the worst possible log n. It's, it's in the middle, which is root log n. So I found this very interesting. Another thing um, is that on the previous slide, I mentioned how if you have a non-adaptive protocol and you want to simulate it using another non-adaptive protocol, then there's a lower bound of log log n. But if you have an adaptive simulation, then there's a constant overhead simulation, which means that there is a log log n separation between adaptive and non-adaptive simulations. And our result actually improves this separation to root log n. It is again showing the separation. This is already known, but our result implies that there is an improved separation between non-adaptive and adaptive simulations. Again, emphasizing the point that adaptive simulations are actually much more powerful than non-adaptive simulations. And in general, adaptive protocols are much more powerful than non-adaptive protocols. Finally, we show this, uh, this result is both an upper bound and a lower bound. And the lower bound part of it, it basically amounts to showing a protocol in the noiseless case that requires a lot of rounds to simulate in the noisy case. And the protocol we consider, it computes a Boolean function. And I do not know why, but Boolean functions over broadcast channels have received a lot of attention. So if people are interested in that literature, I would say that this lower bound even holds for Boolean functions. Even uh, our lower bound example here is the Boolean function. So that is something to, to make note of. Okay, so this was the main result. Uh, it has two parts. There is an upper bound that shows that no matter what your protocol is, with the root log in overhead, I can make it resilient to noise. And there's a lower bound that shows that there is a hard protocol that if you want to make resilient to noise, you need at least a root log in overhead. We have two parts. I will first show the upper bound, which is I will take an arbitrary protocol and I will make it resilient to noise using a root log in overhead. And then I'll show the lower bound. This is what the rest of the talk will be like. So let's get to it. Let's see the upper bound, which is a simulation scheme. And here, like I've said, what we want is we are given an N length protocol. Here I, I'm cheating a bit. The number of parties is N and the protocol may be polynomial in N, but it doesn't doesn't really matter because log n is the same as um, log of any polynomial in n. So this is not changing the argument. It will just mean that I have fewer letters to carry. So we will assume that n is both the length of the protocol and the number of parties. And our goal is to take an arbitrary n length protocol, simulate it in n times root log n rounds, because that is the overhead we're going for, square root log n, 
And let's say we have some low error probability, which is constant or even let's say one over poly. And that's, that's the error probability we're going for. I claim that to accomplish this goal, it suffices to take a K. I will tell you what K is, but it is some function of N. It's actually square root log N. It suffices to take K equals to square root log N protocols, length protocols, simulate them in K square rounds, which is O tilde log N rounds, with error probability two to the minus K square, which is two to the minus log N, which is one over poly N. So the error probability is the same, but now the length has decreased from, the overhead is also the same, the it's K, it's K is root log N, so K is still the overhead, but the length has decreased from N to K. And I claim that this is sufficient. Why? Suppose you have a general N length protocol. What you can do is you can always break it into N over K smaller protocols of K rounds each. And using these smaller protocols, you can simulate each one of them in K square rounds, which means the total number of rounds you need is N over K, the number of smaller protocols, times K square, which is the num number of rounds you need to simulate one small protocol. This will be n over k times k squared. This is n times k, which is n times root log n. This is what we're going for. And all of these simulations will be correct with very high probability because one of them fails with probability 2 to the minus k squared, which is 1 over poly n. You have n over k of them. You can union bound over all of them. And you will get that all of these are correct, except with probability 1 over poly n, which is what we're going for. We wanted to simulate n length protocols in n k or n root, root log n rounds with error probability one over poly n. And the way we'll do it is we'll fix the length to be k and we'll simulate in k square rounds with error probability to the minus k squared. Questions? Cool. So we are now focusing on this reduced role where we have a k length protocol to simulate. We want to simulate it using O of k square rounds. And we want an error probability that is two to the minus k squared. And I want to emphasize this super low error probability, this super low number two to the minus k squared is the real bottleneck. And in fact, this number is so low that you cannot hope for anything better. If you only have k square rounds and you have that every round is corrupted with probability a constant, then the probability that all of the rounds are corrupted is also two to the minus k square or some constant to the minus k square. And therefore, with probability two to the minus k square, you have to fail because then everything is corrupted. You cannot, there's no hope to solve anything. And we are saying that basically, except when you have to fail, except when everything is corrupted, you are correct. So either everything is corrupted, you are very unlucky, or you are able to simulate successfully. This is the best identity you can hope for, and this is our goal. We are given k, k length protocols. We want to simulate in k square rounds with a very low, a super low error probability of two to the minus k square. Now, another way to see why this is the crucial thing here, two to the minus k square, is if I reduce this number, if I do not just reduce it a little bit, let's change it to, sorry, increase it a little bit, two to the minus k. Now, typically when you change a polynomial in the exponent, it doesn't really matter. You ignore all of these things. You just say it's exponential. But here, changing the polynomial in the exponent actually rents the protocol completely trivial. Um, if you only need a success probability of one minus two to the minus k, then here is how you do it. You have a k length protocol that you want to simulate. You repeat every round k times, which means that the total number of rounds will be k squared as desired. And again, you take the majority. Now you repeat it every round k times, which means any round is correct with probability two to the minus k. Um, you can union bound over all the k rounds. You still have two to the minus k. And therefore you get that with probability two to the minus k, you are able to finish the simulation. Okay. So the real deal here is how to get this two to the minus k lower to two to the minus k square, which is the lowest you can get. And this will be, this is what you need to focus on. Okay. Questions? Okay, so before telling you how to do this, let me tell you, uh, let me take you back, I think around 35 years and tell you Gallagher's protocol, which is 
doing something similar in the sense that it is a it takes k log k rounds and it has error probability two to the minus k. So it's again as low as you can hope for. If you have only k log k rounds, then your error has to be at least two to the minus k log k, or let's so ignore the log, it's set up to at least two to the minus k. So it's again very good in terms of error, but it will only be for non-interactive chunks now or non-interactive protocols. I'm using chunks because you have an n-length protocol and a chunk is length k. So what is this non-interactive chunk? I say that a chunk is non-interactive if, if the symbols that the parties are broadcasting, remember you have k rounds, so there are k symbols that are being broadcast. Each one of these symbols is independent of all the previous symbols, which means that party five, for example, the party that is sending the fifth symbol, it doesn't need to know the previous four symbols to compute its symbol. It already knows that even before the protocol starts. So there are K parties. Each one of them already knows what they want to say. And it's just that one of them will speak in the first round. The other one will speak in the second round. The third one will speak in the third round. It's like a simultaneous protocol that will execute in K rounds. So that's what making it non-interactive. And Gallagher essentially showed that if you have a non-interactive chunk, um, okay, this is not what he showed. This is my interpretation of what he showed, is that if you have a non-interactive chunk of length K, then you can simulate it in K log K rounds with error probability two to the minus K. So again, the best possible error you can hope for, the difference is that it's not K square, it's K ignoring log factors. And the other difference, which is the more important one, is that it's not general chunks, it is non-interactive chunks. So let's see how Gallagher did it. His protocol had three different phases. Um, the first phase is the broadcast phase, where you use non-interactivity, you have the fact that everybody knows the symbol they want to say, and they just repeat their symbol log k times, each one of them. Because there are k symbols, this means there is a total of k log k rounds in this phase. And at the end of this phase, because everybody repeated the symbol log k times, you can decode by majority. And you have that with probability, except with probability one over poly k, everybody has the correct symbol of all the other players. You can even mount over all the players and all the, sim all the symbols. You have that after this repetition and after the decoding, everybody has the correct bit for every other player except with probability one over poly k. Okay? And this is exactly the guessing phase. You re you repeated log k times. Now you decode by majority and you guess it. And the promise is that except with probability one over poly k, um, the symbol received by any party is correct for all the other parties. Okay? So these are the first two phases. The third phase is where the magic happens. And in this phase, what the parties do is they boost the error probability down from one over poly k to two to the minus k. So one over poly k is the analog of two to the minus k here for general chunks, where you just repeat it and you got one over poly k. But now you want to boost it to the lowest possible, which is two to the minus k. And even here, we wanted to boost it to the lowest possible, which is two to the minus k squared. So the boost is where the magic happens. And this is what will reduce the error probability down to two to the minus k. So let us understand this. Now, imagine that, suppose, imagine that there is one party, there isn't such a party in real life, but imagine there is some party for which this probability was zero. There was some party that knew all the bits and for all the other parties, you had this failure probability for one over poly k. Okay, so this is a scenario that doesn't actually happen, but we will consider it. Now, in this scenario, the party that knows all the bits, what it can do is it can compute an error correcting code of all of these bits. It will basically, it will means that it will map these k bits to, let's say, 5k bits, such that if you receive any 4k of these bits, you can always recover the original k bits. Okay. This is what an error correcting code does it adds redundancy, it takes k bits to 5k bits, such that you are resilient. Which means even if you not even if you don't receive all these five k bits, let's say you only receive four k bits or three k bits, we can still decode the original k bits. And this is what the party does: it has the k bits. It is promised to have all of these things directly. 
It will encode them using an ECC and error correcting code. So you get five K bits. It will send the encoding. Now each bit is set up to the constant probability. So a large number of them, four K of them will be received directly with, except with probably two to the minus J. This is a standard Chernoff bound. And because you have resilience from an error correcting code. Once you receive these four K bits directly, you're able to decode the original K bits except with probably two to the minus J. Okay. So this is what you would do in the ideal world when you know that there is one party that knows the correct bit, but we actually don't have such a party. So how do you fix this? Well, you use the fact that, and this was the question from earlier, you use the fact that the noise for every single one is independent. So now what you do is, you again have um, everybody again has k bits. Everybody again computes an error correcting code, which is everybody takes these k bits and encodes it to five k bits. Now, what they do is they distributedly broadcast this error correcting code, which means that the first guy will send the first five bits of his error correcting code. The second guy will send the second five bits, which is bits six to 10. The third guy will send bits 11 to 15, and so on and so on till the last guy sends bits. 5k minus um, 4 to 5. Now, I claim that with this distributed way of broadcasting the air correcting code, you still have the same phenomena, that most of these bits are actually correct. And the reason for that is because for every player in the system, he had all the correct bits except with probability 1 or poly k. So except with this small probability, everybody in the system was sending the right error correcting code. It was almost like they're sending the correct thing. The only thing that can go wrong is if many of the players have the incorrect thing. And if one of them had the incorrect thing, it doesn't matter. It only changes five bits in your system. But if a constant fraction of them had an incorrect thing, then you will have a problem. But because the players are independent, the probability that a constant fraction of them have an incorrect thing by a churn of bound is again two to the minus k. Each one is one over poly k, and the probability that a constant fraction, and even if this was a constant, doesn't matter. Each one is a small constant. The probability that a constant fraction of these are wrong is true to the minus k. And you're able to get this uh, by this distributed uh, protocol. So to repeat, once you're guessing, you have a sequence of k bits, which is correct except with probability to the minus k. Everybody computes an error correcting code of this k bits. Now they send it in a distributed way where the first guy sends, let's say the first five bits, the next guy sends the next five bits and so on and so forth. Most of these bits will be correct. So it will be almost like decoding a genuine error correcting code. And once you have a genuine error correcting code, I just argued that you can get an error probability to the minus tape. So this is uh, all there is to Galileo's protocol. And if there are any questions, this is a good time to ask because I know this is a bit, bit tricky to get your head around. No questions? Okay. So this is general, uh, this is not general, this is, this is Gallagher's protocol. It is not general it, in that it only assumes, it assumes that the chunks are non-interactive, but it does get the error length relation that we want. We want k-square rounds and we want the worst possible k-square um, error probability, the best possible. And Gallagher has the same, there are k rounds. And it wants an error probability to the minus k. So can we use it in our system? Can we increase the number of rounds from k to k square and get uh, while maintaining the same relationship in the number of errors and get something for general chunks? So this is what I'll show you next. And the main observation for this part is that even if you have a general chunk, even if the messages all depend on the messages that were there before, the first message is still non-interactive because there's nothing before the first message, right? The first message is the first message. So it is always known in advance. It is non-interactive. And this is what we will use. What we will do is we will error correct or we will simulate by bit by bit. We will run an instance of Gallagher to get the first bit. Now that you know the first bit, now the second bit becomes non-interactive because the first bit is already known. So then you will run another gallery to get the second bit. And then you will know these two bits. Um, so now the third bit will be non-interactive. You will run another gallery to run to get the third bit. If you do it k times, then you will have all the k bits. And this will increase the length by a factor of k, which is uh, what we are willing to suffer. We are willing to go from k to k squared. 
But I claim that this does not, um, this is turret itself is probably two to the minus k square. This maintains the same relationship between the length and the error of an exponential. Why is that? Now, to see that, um, I imagine this whole process as a random walk. So with probability, you start with a transcript of length zero, which is basically saying that initially you don't know anything. Now you run one Gallagher. With probability two to the minus k, it fails. Um, so there is this whole issue of how you detect whether it failed or not, but it can be done. Let's say you know how to do it. So with probability two to the minus k, you stay at zero. But with probability one minus two to the minus k, it succeeded and you move to one. So you always make progress except with probability two to the minus k. And now the question is how many, suppose you have two k rounds, what is the likelihood that in two k rounds you do not progress all the way to k? And the answer is it's, it's very small. You want to fail k times in two k rounds. The probability of failing once is two to the minus k. So the probability of failing k times is two to the minus k squared. It's a union amount over all the possibilities. It works out. Um, and overall, what you get is that the error probability is two to the minus k squared. The length is k squared, and you're able to simulate general chance of length k. Um, which implies by the argument I had before that you can simulate general protocols of length n with an overhead of root log n, except with probability one or poly n. So this is the this is a good point actually to have some questions because this is the first part of the result, which is showing that you can take any protocol, you can simulate it um, with an overhead of root log n and an error probability one or poly n. Now the next part will be I will give you a particular hard protocol that needs a at least root log in rounds to be simulated. So this will be the matching lower bound. But before that, let's let's just pause and see if there are any questions about the upper bound. Okay, cool. So there are no questions. Let's go to the lower bound now. Um, let us again recall what we want to show here. What we want to show is that there is a protocol such that, let's say it has length n, such that if you want to simulate it, you need at least an overhead of root log n, which means your total length will be n times root log n. And um, let's say you have some success probability, let's say you have a constant success probability even, that that's what you're going for, okay? So this is the result we want to show. We want to show a hard protocol such that any way to simulate this protocol requires an overhead of at least root log n. Now, I want to connect this back to our upper bound. And I want to do it by, again, going back to Gallagher and recalling what Gallagher actually gave us is that if your protocol or your chunk is non-interactive, then a k-length chunk can always be simulated. If it's non-interactive, it can always be simulated in k log k rounds and an error probability of two to the minus k. Now, what this implies is that if your whole protocol, not just one chunk, if your entire protocol is non-interactive, then you cannot hope to get this lower bound. Then, then your protocol is actually easy to simulate. Why? Well, if your whole protocol is non-interactive, then so is each chunk of length k, which means for each chunk of length k, you can apply this trick and get a simulation with error probability two to the minus k and k log k rounds. Now, because our error probability here is two to the minus k and not two to the minus k square, look at what happens if I take k equals to log n, roughly, let's say 10 log n. Then what happens is that a chunk of length 10 log n can be simulated except with probability one over n to the 10, which is some small polynomial, in only log n times log log n number of rounds with an overhead of log log n. Now, as soon as your error probability becomes one over poly n, you can union bound over all the chunks. There are only at most n of them. Therefore, what this implies is that if you have a non interactive protocol of length n, you can simulate it with an overhead of log log n um, with some probability that is uh, error probability that is polynomial in n. And the lower bound we want to show is the lower bound of square root log. So any non-interactive 
interactive protocol is easy. It cannot give us this lower bound because we know that there is a lot lot in simulation for any non-interactive protocol. There is a lot lot in simulation for any non-interactive protocol. And if we have to have any hope of proving such a lower bound, then we need to go to um, then we need to go to actually interactive protocols where things depend on the best they have seen so far. Okay, so let us see what is the interactive protocol that is hard. Now, to explain this interactive protocol, let me fix some values. Let me fix um, n equals to five, and also the number of rounds t, which has always been like it has always been in the start, would also be equal to n, which is equal to five. So both their n players and their n rounds, and the hard protocol is as follows. The first guy, he sends a bit, it, it's his input. The second guy, the, the green one, he looks at the bit he received from the, there is noiseless, this is noiseless, so every bit is received correctly. He looks at the bit he received from the first guy. He uses it to compute a function and compute a bit of his own. Then he sends this bit. Now the third guy, he again looks at the bits he received from one and two. He uses these two bits to compute a bit of his own and he broadcasts it. Now the fourth guy will look at all the three things before and broadcast a bit of his own and so on and so on. So every guy, he computes and broadcasts one bit, but this bit depends on all the previous bits. And this is exactly what makes interactive protocols hard. The reason interactive protocols are hard is because to compute your bit, you need to know, you need to have heard everything before. Player I cannot broadcast before hearing player I minus one because then he does not even have enough information to compute his own bit. Um, if he hasn't heard player I minus one, the best thing he can hope for is maybe he can guess what player I minus one said and then he can use the guess to compute an answer that is carried with probability half, let's say. But um, this is not sustainable. You cannot keep guessing and be carried with probability half because eventually you will just fail. So let's not go into this detail. Let's just say that if player I has not heard player I minus one, then there's no way he can broadcast because he does not even have the inputs required to compute its function. Okay, is that is that clear? So this is the protocol we will work with. It's an interactive protocol with n equals to five rounds. And um, the first player knows the bit it wants to send and all the future players will compute their bit after they have heard everyone before. Player two will compute the bit after hearing from player one. Player three will compute its bit after hearing from the first two players and so on and so forth. Now, I claim that, okay, this is obviously a noiseless protocol. It's obviously non-adaptive because player one speaks in round one, you know that player two speaks in round two, you know that and so on. I claim that simulating this noiseless non-adaptive protocol by a non-adaptive protocol in the noisy case requires an overhead of at least root log n, which is the lower one I want to show. I have n rounds, I want to show that you need at least root log in many rounds. Equivalently, if I take the counterpositive, I have to show that if you have a simulation of length at most root log n, then it cannot simulate this noiseless protocol that we just described. Okay, so let's let's prove this. Now, you take any arbitrary simulation. The length of the simulation I will use t prime to denote the length of the simulation. And think of t prime as something small. t prime is less than n times root log n. It's not less than here, but for large n, let's say, it is less than n times root log n. And I will show that for any such simulation, it cannot simulate this noisy protocol um, with uh, a good error, uh, with a good success probability. Now, we need to use the fact that it's non-adaptive because we know adaptive protocols can do the simulation. So, we also, uh, as we also take that into consideration. We say that the simulation is not adaptive. So for every round R from one to 20, you know in advance who is speaking in this round. So for example, you know that player one is speaking in round one, um, player two is speaking in round two, player three is speaking in round three. Then maybe player two didn't hear player one, so it gets a second chance. So player one again speaks in round four, giving player two a second chance to hear him. Um, but after that, player four jumps in, then player two. So you have some arbitrary order uh, in which the players are talking. And um, this is this is the description of the protocol. There is some function that they compute, and this is the order in which they talk. 
Now, I want to show that for any such sequence, I have one, but it could be anything. For any such sequence, you cannot simulate this original protocol with five rounds um, with any good success probability. Now, to make the exposition simpler, let me let me break it into, actually not break it. Let me actually just simplify it. Let me say that, let's say I don't want to deal with any probabilities at all. And I will, what I will do is I will look at the, suppose I am all powerful. Suppose I know all the things that are happening in the system. I will look at the smallest number of bits that I need to change such that, such that I can fail the protocol. Okay, so there's some communication that is happening. You have 20 rounds. Player one is saying something in the first round, player two is saying something in the second round, so on and so forth. I want to look at the smallest number of bits that I need to change, the smallest number of um, messages from player I to player J that I need to change, such that at the end, player I cannot broadcast. There is an I that cannot broadcast because he hasn't heard the previous I minus one players directly. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. For every round, I want to consider the smallest number of bits that I need to affect, that I need to corrupt, to make sure that in this round, the player that is talking, it cannot broadcast its bits, its bit, because it hasn't heard everybody that was um, before it till this round. Okay, so this is a tricky notion, and we will explain this with an example. Consider rounds where player one is talking. Now, player one is starting um, in these red rounds. And for player one, there is nobody before it. So he always know what's what he wants to send. And another way to say this is no matter how many bits you corrupt, you can never stop player one from talking in one of these red rounds. Okay. So the number of corruptions required to stop player one from talking in one of these red rounds is infinity. Okay, that's the number tor r that you need for this. This is how, this is an example computation. So here, the number of uh, corruptions you need for player one to not be able to say his bit is infinity because you can never stop this from happening, okay? Now let us look at player two and specifically let us look at the second round. In this round, I claim that the only way player two will not be able to say what he has to say is if he did not hear player one from the round before. Okay, if he heard player one, then of course he knows everything before him and he can always. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so he heard player one in the previous round and he can always compute and broadcast the bit he wants to say. The only way player two will not be able to broadcast is if he did not hear player one in the first round. Now, player one definitely did broadcast because this was infinity. So he definitely did broadcast. The only way this did not get to player two is if it was corrupted. So the only way player two did not talk here is if I corrupted the message that was sent in this round to player two. And this requires one corruption. Okay. So this is the combination that I'm doing. I want player two to not be able to talk here. Player one definitely talks here. So I need to stop this from reaching player two, which means I need to invest one corruption. And that is the number you see here. Okay. Let us look at this player two. I claim that for this die, the number is five. It's, a, it's again a simple argument. The only way this player to this round um, does not block us the right bit is if he did not know one. Now, one definitely broadcast here. So the only way this did not reach player two by six rounds is if all of these were corrupted. Now, to corrupt this all the way to six, it requires five corruptions. And therefore, this number here is five. And you can then compute this number here will be nine by the same argument. This number here will be 17 by the same argument. And this is how you do it. Now, this was simple because player one always talks. So let's see, let's go one more level and let's see how player three computes it. And this will be the general case. So I will consider this number here. Now, to see how many corruptions are needed to stop player three from talking in round eight, one has to make sure that player three does not know players player two's bit by round eight. Now, what are the 
places that player three can learn player two's bit from. Now it can learn it here and it can learn it here. Okay. So let us set up this one. Let us say that you corrupted player to here. Then the only way to stop player three from knowing player two is to make sure that after player two sport in round six, it did not reach player three. Okay. Again, we want to stop player three from knowing player two by round eight. The way to do it is one way to do it. It's not the way. One way to do it is to stop player two from talking by round two. So in round two, he did not say anything meaningful. The only place it can say anything meaningful then is round six. And once it says something meaningful, I corrupt it uh, so that it does not reach round three. So I have two options. I can either stop player two from saying something meaningful, or I can allow him to say something meaningful. I can stop it from going to round three. What is the total cost? To stop player two from saying something meaningful in this round, I need one corruption. Now, to stop player three from receiving what player two sent in round six, I need two corruptions because it will be talking in round six and I will need to corrupt it once and then twice. So the total number of corruptions I have to make to make sure that three does not talk in round eight is three. One to stop this from happening and two to make sure the information does not pass from six to eight. And this is the number you see. And you can do this calculation for all the rounds. Um, you will get this. It's not, um, I don't want you to read these numbers. I'll give you the general formula now. Suppose you have some player three talking in round R, then you want to make sure that player three does not speak uh, the direct symbol in round R. You, can, you have two ways to stop this. One, you can make sure that player two did not speak so far. And second, you can make sure that player two spoke but did not reach player three. So you have a combination of these attacks that you can make. And in general, the combination will look like the following. You have this round R, you want to compute for of R, which is the number of corruptions needed to stop player three from speaking in round R. Core of R is at most for any R prime where player two is talking. You made sure that till that R prime player two did not speak directly. And then the next time he taught, it's fine. You can allow him to talk. But after that, you made sure that it did not reach player three. So the number of corruptions required to stop player three from speaking something meaningful in round R is at most the number of corruptions required to stop player two in round R prime plus R minus next R prime, which is the number of um, additional corruptions you have to invest to stop player two's bid from reaching player three, okay? So this is the formula. This is the hardest uh, slide in this talk. After that, I will hand wave the rest of the proof. Um, so let's see what this means. We have this formula. We can put all the corruption terms on one side. So now I know what is for R minus for R prime. It is at most the difference between R and next R prime. And let us see what this implies about the number of corruptions needed to stop the last round player, the round T prime. I want to compute core of T prime. Okay. So this is not easy, but hand waving is easy. I want to compute core of T prime. I will use a, a telescoping argument. So I know core of R minus core of R prime. Um, then I will use uh, tor of r prime minus tor of r double prime, so on and so on. Eventually, I'll add all of them up and I want to, I claim that I will get something like this. Why? Um, let's see. So what is the easiest way to see this? Um, okay, so here's one way to see this. There are t prime rounds in the system and there are n players. So let's say everything is balanced. I know that one player speaks in roughly T prime or N rounds because things are balanced roughly. So there are T prime rounds, there are N players and one player speaks in roughly T prime or N rounds, okay? And every time you do the telescoping, you go back one round, you, you lose something because you count R prime, but there's this next round. So if this was the last round where player three was talking, R prime will not be the last round where player two was talking, it will be the round before. And then when you go to our double prime, it will not be the round before the last round, it will be the two rounds before that. So there are only T prime over N steps that you can take because one player only speaks T prime over N times. 
So that is the first T' ORN. And the second T' ORN again comes from the fact that you have T' round in total. The difference between the last rounds, there are n such things. Let's say they're all balanced again. They don't have to be, but it's a hand wavy argument. So the difference between the two last rounds will again be T' ORN. So you'll have things that look like T' ORN, T' ORN times, which means core T' prime will be at most this number, and you can rearrange it to get T prime is at least n times square root power of T. Now, all of this is in the model where the number of eruptions is adversarial. You are carefully choosing which rounds you want to corrupt, but this is not how random corruptions work. Random corruptions, you have no control. Every round will be corrupted with some constant probability. So how do we get a bound for random corruptions? Now, for that, I claim that if you only need log in rounds to corrupt something, then the probability that if you have a small number of rounds, let's say you have um, R rounds, or maybe not R, let's say you have M rounds, then the probability that a random noise model corrupts all these N rounds is two to the minus M because every round is some constant, let's say half. And if you want to corrupt all N, that, that is two to the minus M. So if this star is small, if this star is like log N, then the probability that you actually realize these eruptions is one over poly n. And in fact, um, so this is the hand wavy part. In fact, you can boost this up. You, If this score is log n, if it's less than um, log n, then you can boost this probability. You can show that there is, it's not easy, but you can show that the probability that one such set of corruptions will be realized is not just one over poly, it's actually a constant. And therefore you will fail the probability of constant. So you want tor to be less than log n for this to go through, which is what we put here. And you get that t prime is at least n root log n, which is the bar we wanted to show. So that's the whole result. We are able to show both an upper bound and lower bound. Both of them match at root log n. The upper bound shows that any non-adaptive protocol can be simulated by another non-adaptive protocol with a root log n over it. The lower round shows that if your protocol is non-interactive, which means every round depends on all the rounds before, then you need these root log in, uh, you need this root log nowhere to be able to successfully accomplish simulation. Um, the first part was, I basically proved the whole thing. It was Gallagher. Um, you break it into chunks, you go from non-interactive chunks to general chunks, and then you uh, cover all chunks one by one. For the second part, I analyzed this adversarial model, which was, different from the random model because here you can pick and choose the corruptions you want to make. But it did give me a bound on the number of corruptions and I was able to transfer this back to the random model by saying that anything less than log n, we can have a lower bound for the random model. And this is the, this is why we get n times root log n. So those are both the bounds. Um, if there are any questions, uh, that's all I had to say. So if there are any questions, uh, I can bring them up now. Thanks a lot, Professor, for a very interactive and an informative talk. I request the audience to feel free to ask any questions if there are any. Uh, I guess there are no more questions, Professor. Thank you, everyone, for attending the talk and have a great evening. Thanks a lot once more, Professor, for, uh, for giving us very interactive talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye.